Hi everybody! In this video, I'll be going over the review sheet for test number three, which is on the 3D unit. The 3D unit is mainly made up of cross-sections of 3D solids, um, going from a 2D to a 3D solid with rotations, questions about planes, and also volume and density. So question number one says, which figure can have the same cross-section as a sphere? So a sphere is like a 3D circle. It's completely circular. So any cross-section that you take of a sphere, whether you slice the sphere horizontally, vertically, or slant it at some like random angle, no matter what, any slice that you pull out of a sphere will always be a circle. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking through the answer choices and I'm seeing which of the answer choices could give me a circle if I slice it in some way. So jumping out to me is number two. Number two is a cone. And we know that a cone by definition does have a circular base and we can see it also in the picture. So if we slice the cone parallel to the base, we will get a circle, which is the same as the cross section of a sphere. Since choices one, three, and four, are all made up of figures that have straight edges. Um, I don't think we're going to get a circular cross-section, no matter which way we slice, choices one, three, or four. Number one is a rectangular prism. Uh, number three is some kind of pyramid. I can't really tell what the base is. It looks like it might be like a rectangular prism or like a trapezoidal prism. Um, it's a pyramid, sorry. It's some kind of pyramid. And number four looks like a prism. Um, they don't really tell us what they are, but I can see that they all have straight line edges. So the only one that I can possibly get a circular slice out of is the cone. Question number two shows a hexagonal prism. That means the bases are in the shapes of hexagons. If the prism is parallel to the base, what shape would the cross section be? So remember that with prisms, any time you take a cross section that's parallel to the base, a horizontal cross section, it will always be the same as the bases. So since the bases here are hexagons, it will be a hexagon. And I'm not the best at drawing, and it's really hard here on the computer, but let me try my best to draw you a picture of that. So if I slice horizontally close to the top, I have a hexagon. If I slice horizontally, out the bottom, I have a hexagon as well. And if I slice horizontally somewhere in the middle or any of the way up, it's always the same hexagon figure anytime I slice horizontally or parallel to the base. Okay, so now we're talking about perpendicular to the base, which is a vertical cross section. And we know that a vertical cross section is always congruent to the faces. So here, the faces of the prism, and once again, that's specifically for prisms, the vertical cross section is congruent to the faces. So the faces here look like they are rectangles, um, either rectangles or parallelograms. Here, looking like rectangles to me, so I'm going to write down a rectangle. True or false? This prism can have a triangular cross-section. The answer to that would be true. Um, as you guys can probably see, if we slice at an angle, there is a way that we can get a triangular cross-section. So I'm going to write true for that one. True or false, this prism can have a circular cross-section. False. As you guys can probably tell, there's all straight edges, straight lines making up this hexagonal prism. So no matter how we slice it, we are not going to get a circular cross section from it. Question number three. Lines K1 and K2 intersect at point E. Line M is perpendicular to lines K1 and K2 at point E. Which statement is always true? Lines K1 and K2 are perpendicular to each other. 
line M is parallel to the plane determined by lines K1 and K2. Line M is perpendicular to the plane determined by lines K1 and K2. Line M is coplanar, that means on the same plane, with lines K1 and K2. So I think it's pretty clear that lines K1 and K2 are not perpendicular to each other. They don't form right angles with each other. So I'm going to cut this out. Um, I think it's pretty clear that line M isn't parallel to lines K1 and K2. In fact, it's perpendicular to them, so I'm going to cross two out. Line M is perpendicular to lines K1 and K2, so it will be perpendicular to the plane that lines K1 and K2 are on, because if it's perpendicular to them, then it's got to be perpendicular to the plane that they form. So that makes three our correct answer choice. I'm going to circle that over here. Moving along, answer uh, question four says that line K is drawn so that it is perpendicular to two distinct planes P and R. So I'm going to do my best to draw the situation. So line K is perpendicular to planes P. So this is plane P and plane R. And line K is perpendicular to both, meaning that it forms right angles with both. And the question saying what must be true about planes P and R. So I think it's clear that planes P and R must be parallel to each other. They're not perpendicular because they're both perpendicular to the same line. So that actually makes them parallel. Um, and we can see that from the picture. If they're both perpendicular to line K, then that means that they are parallel to each other because they're both forming right angles with the same line. Okay, moving along. Which three-dimensional figure will result when a rectangle six inches long and five inches wide is continuously rotated around the longer side? Okay, so let me make my rectangle. Let me continue labeling my rectangle. So we have six for the longer side, five for the shorter side. So you can imagine when we rotate a rectangle around a side, um, you can hold up a piece of paper and imagine that that's your rectangle. And if you fold your piece of paper, you end up with a cylinder. So anytime we rotate a rectangle around any line, so in this case, we're rotating around the longer side, it is going to form into a cylinder. And I can draw you a picture of what that's going to look like as best as I can. The straight edges become curved and we end up with a cylinder. So as we can see here, the radius of the cylinder is five, and the height of the cylinder is six. So that would be answer choice number three. In the diagram below, right triangle ABC has legs whose length are four and six. What is the volume of the 3D object formed by continuously rotating the right triangle around AB? We're rotating around AB, so you can imagine that this is like a flag, and it's spinning faster and faster and faster around the flagpole. And what happens is it spins around and around, and the straight edges become circular, and what we have is a cone. Okay, so now we have a cone. And the volume formula for a cone is pi r squared times height. We can see here that the radius of our cone is 4. So let me plug that in. Pi 4 squared. And the height is 6. Okay, so it doesn't say to round. So I am going to just multiply on my calculator without putting pi in. So I'm going to do 4 squared, that's 16, times 6, and I get 96. So volume is equal to 96 pi cubic units. It doesn't have units, so I'm just going to write units cubed for the volume. 
Circle O is centered at the origin. In the diagram below, a quarter of circle O is graphed. Which three-dimensional figure is generated when the quarter circle is continuously rotated around the y-axis? So we're taking this quarter of a circle and we're spinning it and spinning it and spinning it and spinning it around and around and around the y-axis. It's already circular, so it's still going to be circular. But notice how it's not going to be a full sphere. It's going to be half of a sphere, which is a hemisphere. Has a base with a length of 25, 9, and a height of 12. A second prism has a square base with a side of 15. If the volumes of the two prism are, prisms are equal, what is the height of the second prism? The rectangular prism, we have volume is area of the base times the height. Since it's a rectangle base, the area of the base is length times width. So we have length times width times height. For the prism with the square base, the volume formula is still area of the base times the height. But since the base is a square, it's length times width, but the length and width are the same since all sides of a square are equal. So we can also write this as side squared times height. Or you can write length times width and just recognize that the length and the width are the same because it is a square. So for the first prism, we know that we have the rectangular prism. We know that it has a length of 25, a width of 9, and a height of 12. So I can actually find the volume here, 25 times 9 times 12. I know that that is 2,700 units cubed. And I know about the second prism that a side of the square base is 15. So we have 15 squared times whatever the height is. And I know that 15 squared is 225. So basically what we need to figure out is what H is so that the volume is the same as the rectangular prism. So we want the volume to equal 2700. We just need to figure out what the height is to make the volume 2700. So we can just solve for H by dividing 225 on both sides. And I got that H is equal to 12. And that's all we need to do for this question. What is the formula for the volume of any prism? The volume of any prism is area of the base times the height. What is the formula for the volume of a pyramid? The volume of any pyramid is one third area of the base times the height of the pyramid. If the prism and the pyramid have the exact same base and height, so if this is the same in both of them, which would have a larger volume? The prism would have a larger volume because the pyramid has the one third in front of it. So even if everything else is the same, the volume of a pyramid would be one third of the volume of the prism, which is smaller. So the volume of the prism would be bigger than the volume of the pyramid, even if everything else is the same. The regular pyramid has a square base. The perimeter of the base is 36 inches, and the height of the pyramid is 15 inches. What is the volume of the pyramid in cubic inches? So volume of any pyramid is one-third area of the base times the height. We have a square base, and we spoke about before how in a square, all of the sides are equal. So we could either write length times width for the area of the square base, or we can just write side squared, which is the same as length times width, except all the sides are the same because we do have a square. Okay, so it tells us that the perimeter of the base is 36. So that means if we took all four sides of the square base and we added them together, we get 36 square has four equal sides, that means each of the sides is 9. 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 is 36. So for side, I'm going to plug in 9 because each side of the square base is 9. And then we need the height of the pyramid, which is 15. From here, I'm just going to plug into my calculator. Um, it says in cubic inches, but it doesn't tell us how to round. 
Oh, wait, I don't think we're going to have to round here. Let's take a look. One third, nine squared times 15. Yes, we're not going to have to round here. It works out to be a whole number. We have 405 inches cubed because it said for our answer to be in cubic inches. What is the volume of a hemisphere that has a diameter of 12.6 to the nearest tenth of a cubic centimeter? So a hemisphere is half of a sphere. So volume of a sphere is four thirds pi or cubed. And then once we find the volume of the sphere, we can take half of it to find the volume of half of a sphere or a hemisphere. So the diameter is 12.6. So that means the radius is diameter divided by 2. 12.6 divided by 2 is 6.3. So let me plug that in. We have 4 thirds pi 6.3 cubed. So let me put this into my calculator. 4 over 3 pi 6.3. Hitting the math button so I can get the cubed symbol and i got about 1047.394424332 now notice how that's answer choice number two but that's here to trick you because that's the volume of a whole sphere with the radius given here we need hemisphere which is half of a sphere so now we actually need to divide our volume of the sphere by two to get the volume of half of the sphere. And when we divide by two, I get approximately 523.7, rounded to the nearest tenth of a, of a cubic centimeter. So that's answer question number one. This is packed in a cylindrical container as shown in the diagram below. The diameter of the container is 13 centimeters and its height is 24. Determine in terms of pi the volume of the cylinder. So, Volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times height. If my diameter is 13, if I divide 13 by 2, I get that the radius is 6.5. So let me plug that in. Volume is equal to pi 6.5 squared. And it tells me that the height of the cylinder is 24. Our answer should be in terms of pi. So I'm not going to type the pi into my calculator. I'm going to type in the 6.5 squared times the 24. Oops, I typed that in wrong. Let me try that again. 6.5 squared times 24. And I got 1,014. That's a zero. 1,014 pi. And our answer should be in cubic centimeters. So I got 1,014 pi cubic centimeters. Okay. A paper container in the shape of a right circular cone has a radius of 2 inches and a height of 8 inches. Determine and state the number of cubic inches in the volume of the cone in terms of pi. Also express your answer to the nearest tenth. So they want our answer in terms of pi and also to the nearest tenth. So we have volume of a cone is one third pi r squared height. The radius here is three inches. So I'm going to plug that in for radius. And the height is eight inches. So I'm going to plug that in for height. First, we need the answer in terms of pi. So I'm going to put everything into the calculator except for the pi. One third times 3 squared times 8, and I get 24. So we have 24 pi inches cubed as our answer in terms of pi. To get it not in terms of pi, round it to the nearest tenth, I'm going to just multiply by pi in my calculator. So I have 24 times pi, and I get approximately 75.4 inches cubed rounded to the nearest tenth. In the diagram below, a right circular cone with a radius of 3 inches has a slant height of 5 inches. 
and a right cylinder with a radius of four inches has a height of six inches. Determine and state the number of full cones of water needed to completely fill the cylinder with water. So first we need to find the volume of the cone and the volume of the cylinder so that we know how much the cone holds and we know how much the cylinder holds so we can figure out how much of these is going to fill this. So volume of a cone is one third pi r squared times height. The height would be this dotted line over here because remember height is the altitude. We measure it by a straight up and down perpendicular line. So we know that the slant height is five. So if we use the Pythagorean theorem and let me do my work over here. Let me erase this for now so I can have some more space for this. So if we do the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. We have one of the legs is three. We're finding the other leg, which is the height. And we have that the hypotenuse is 5. We have 9 plus b squared is equal to 25. Subtracting 9 from both sides, b squared is equal to 16. The square root of 16 is 4. So we have that the height is 4. So if I plug into my volume formula, I have volume is equal to 1 third high. 3 squared, 3 is the radius, times the height, which is 4. So I'm going to put that into my calculator, and I'll write the volume of the cone down here. So in my calculator, I'm going to type in 1 third times pi times 3 squared times 4. Oops, I typed it in wrong. Once again, 1 third times pi times three squared times four. And I got about 37.699 cubic inches. Now for the volume of the cylinder, volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times height. Here they give us that the radius is four and that the height was six of the cylinder. So I'm just gonna type into my calculator, pi radius, which is four squared times 16. I'm gonna hit enter. And I got the volume of the cylinder is approximately 804.248 cubic inches. Now, to find how many full cones of water can fill the cylinder, I'm just going to divide the total volume that the cylinder can hold, 804.248, by the volume that the cone can hold to see how many uh, cups of water it's going to take to fill the cylinder. So let me divide by 37.699. And I got approximately 21.33333. Okay, so I must have made a mistake typing into my calculator before because when you type in pi times 4 squared times 6, it's 301, not 804. So let me just change that. Um, you were probably wondering the same thing when you did it. I typed it in incorrectly. So that's about 301. 0.4593 inches cubed. And now when we divide this by that, we should get the correct thing. So let me divide the total volume of the cylinder by the total volume of the cone. And I get eight full cups of water. So it takes eight full cups of water, cones of water, to completely fill the cylinder. The diagram shows a wooden block that has a hole drilled in it. The diameter of the hole is two centimeters. So let me put that in here, the diameter of the hole. So that's the whole way across. Sorry for my terrible drawing, is two centimeters. Calculate the volume of the solid. 
So basically, what we need to do is find the total volume of the whole rectangular prism, get rid of the cylinder because that's just an empty space, and see what's left over to get the volume of the solid. So the volume of the entire thing, if it were filled, filled would be area of the base times the height. And since the bases are rectangles, the area of the rectangular base would be ln times width times the height of the prism. So length and width of the base, that's 4 and 6. And height of the prism, that's 6 as well. So moving that into my calculator, that's 4 times 6 times 6. I get 144 centimeters cubed. Now we need to figure out the volume of the cylinder. So that would be pi r squared times height. If the diameter is 2, half of that would be 1. So the radius would be 1. And the height, how tall the cylinder is, would be 6. So we have pi, or I'll just write 6 pi for now, and then I'll type into the calculator after. So that's 6 pi cubic centimeters. So all I need to do now is take my 144 and subtract 6 pi to see what's left over when we take the cylinder part that's empty out of the rectangular prism. So let me subtract 6 pi from 144, and it says to round to the nearest hundredth. So I got approximately 125.15 cubic centimeters, sorry, centimeters cubed. I wrote centimeters squared. There we go. There we go. The diagram below represents Joe's two fish tanks. Joe's larger tank is completely filled with water. He takes water from it to completely fill the small tank. So we're taking water from the big tank and filling the smaller tank. Determine how many cubic inches of water will remain in the larger tank. So we need to see how much is going to be left over in the larger tank after we take the water out of here and completely fill the smaller tank. So let's see how much the larger tank can hold. So that's a rectangular prism. So let's do length times width times height. So we have 12 times 30 times 16. Let me do that in my calculator. 12 times 30 times 16. I get 5,760. Okay. Let me find the volume of the smaller one. Once again, that's length times width times height. So let me do 6 times 12 times 9. 6 times 12 times 9. And I get 648 cubic inches. So now we are trying to figure out that if we take water from here and put it into here, how much is going to be left over? So if I divide 5,760, that's how much the larger tank can hold. By 648, that's how much the smaller tank can hold. I see, let me write that down over here. So if I take 5,760 and I divide by 648, I see that 8.8888. A A A A A nine cubic inches. Um. So I see that we can take. Actually, no need because all we are doing. I'm sorry. I just realized that looking at these questions for the first time as well. If. The bigger tank can hold 5,760 and the smaller tank can hold 648. Then we're just taking 648 cubic inches from the bigger one and moving it to the smaller one. So we're just taking it out of here. So all we have to do is just take away 648 from the big one because that's what's going into the smaller one 648 cubic inches. So on my calculator, if I do 5,760 and I 648 from it, I get 5,112 5, cubic inches are what's left over in the bigger tank. 
And that's all there is to this one. Okay, a rectangular tabletop will be made of maple wood that weighs 43 pounds per cubic foot. Pounds per cubic foot. Two units, a mass unit and a volume unit. I know that this number is density. Remember, density has two units, a mass unit and a volume unit. So if you see two units attached to a number, keep in mind that that's density. The tabletop will have a length of 8 feet, a width of 8 feet, and a thickness of 1 inch. Determine and state the weight of the tabletop in pounds. So we're finding the weight or the mass. So if we want to use the formula density is equal to mass over volume, then we are going to have to find the volume. They already tell us the density. Let me start plugging in. So the density is 43 pounds per cubic foot. We need to find the mass, so I'm going to label that X, and we need to calculate the volume, and since our volume unit attached to our density was cubic feet, our volume should be in cubic feet as well. So we have a rectangular tabletop, so volume is length times height, so length is 8 feet, width is 3 feet, and we, the thickness is one inch, but everything else is in feet. So before we can calculate the volume, and we need our volume to be in cubic feet, I just need to convert this one inch to feet. And we know that we convert inches to feet by dividing by 12. So I'm just going to take one inch and divide it by 12 to convert it into feet. And that's an annoying number. That is 0 0.08333. There's a lot of threes. I'll just write down three of them. So I'm going to multiply. Let me multiply 8. That's our first number. By 13. By 0 0.08333333. And I get the volume. Approximately 8.666. There's a lot of sixes and then it ends with a seven. So I'll just write a couple of sixes and then round it with a seven. So let me write that in our density formula for volume. 8.66667. I just tried to keep a couple of decimal places. I didn't write down all of them. So when we cross multiply now to find the mass, we have cubic feet and cubic feet. So that cancels out once in the numerator, once in the denominator. So that means that our mass is going to be in pounds, which the question does ask us for our answer in pounds. So that makes sense. Pounds. And all we have to do is multiply this number, the 8.6667 number, by 43. That's for cross multiplication. And I get... Okay, so once again, I made a mistake. So first of all, this chart was not supposed to be part of it, um, but that wasn't the mistake. I think you're probably realizing like how does this chart connect? So this is not part of the question. I accidentally copied it and it's not part of it. Um, but this was a three and I typed it into my calculator as a 13. So you're probably like, where is this number coming from over here? So let me do that again. So eight times three, times when we did the 1 divided by 12 to convert from inches to feet, this should be 2. You're probably wondering where did this number come from. So this should be 2. Okay, and then when we cross multiply, we have 43 times 2, and we get 86 pounds. And that's our final answer. There we go, 86 pounds. Um, I'm messing up a lot today on this video typing wrong things into my calculator. Okay, let's move along. A cargo trailer pictured below can be modeled by a rectangular prism and a triangular prism. Inside the trailer, the rectangular prism measures 6 feet wide and 10 feet long. The walls that form the triangular prism 
each measure four feet wide inside the trailer. The diagram below is of the floor showing the inside measurements of the trailer. If the inside height of the trailer is six and a half feet, what is the total volume of the inside of the trailer to the nearest cubic foot? Okay, so let's do it. So all we need to do is find the total volume of everything that's going on here. So I'm going to start with the rectangular prism. So volume of the rectangular prism is length times width times height. And we see that the length and the width are 10 and 6. And in the question, they tell us that the height all the way of everything inside the cargo truck, um, the height inside the trailer is 6.5 feet. So that's the height of the entire truck. Okay. So in my calculator, I have 10 times 6 times 6.5. And I get 390 cubic feet. Now I need the volume of the triangular prism. So volume of any prism is area of the base times the height. The base is a triangle. So first I need to find the area of the triangle base and then multiply by the height of the entire prism of the entire trailer, which is 6.5. So I'm going to leave a space for area of the base, but then the height that we're going to be multiplying by is 6.5 because that's the height the whole way through the trailer. Okay, so now area of the triangular base. So area of any triangle is one half base times height. I see that the height is this dotted line. I don't know what it is yet. But this is 6, so this whole thing here is 6. So we have 3 and we have 3. So we have a right triangle. All I need to do is find the other leg, and that will be the height. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem. I can do 3 squared plus the other leg, b squared, is equal to 4 squared. That's the hypotenuse. 9 plus b squared is equal to 16. Then I have b squared is equal to 7. So B is equal to radical 7. So area is 1 half. The base is 6. And the height of the triangular base is radical 7. All I need to do is plug this into my volume formula because this is the area of the triangular base. So that's 1 half, 6 times radical 7 times the height of the trailer. And now I have my volume of the bottom part of the rectangular prism and the volume of the top part of the triangular prism. All I have to do is add the two volumes together. Let me do that on my calculator. I'm going to add the 390 plus, that's, actually, maybe I should multiply this first and then add it to this. So let me multiply this together first. So I have one half times six times, Radical 7 times 6.5. Okay, and then I'm adding that to the volume of the rectangular prism, which is 390. And I got that the volume is approximately, it says nearest cubic foot, that's nearest whole number. So the volume is approximately 442 cubic feet. For the next one, the important thing to understand is that Cavalieri's principle says the following two things. Well, the following thing. It says that two objects have equal volumes if they have same area of the cross section parallel to the base. So in other words, same area of the base and same heights. So here, for the two figures that they give you, since they are both triangular prisms, 
their bases are both triangles and their cross sections parallel to the base, no matter how you slice it, will always be triangles. I just wanted to show you that. So their cross section parallel to the base is both a triangle. And if you know this, if we take the area of this triangle base, that's one half. Base is eight times height is five. And this one, if we took the area, area is one half. Base is five. Height is eight. These are exactly the same. So they have the same area of the base, which is the same area of the cross section parallel to the base because that's a triangle just like the base. And notice how the heights are the same of the two figures. So they satisfy the two conditions necessary to use Cavalieri's principle. So they have equal volumes according to Cavalieri's principle. And again, if two objects have the same area of the cross section parallel to the base, so the same area of the base, and they have the same height, then they have equal volumes. This last one is a bit tricky. So basically, uh, we want to find the volume of the kickboard for part A, but the hand grips are not actually part of the kickboard. So what we need to do is find the area of the kickboard and then subtract the hand grips. So let's separate the kickboard into two parts. The bottom part is a rectangle, like 3D rectangle, and the top part is like... Um, a little bit circular, and it's 3D as well. So remember, we can think of volume as area of the base times the height. So, and height also can mean thickness, depending on the object, height, depth, thickness, all of the same thing. So, bottom, the rectangular parts, I'm going to do that part in black. So, volume would be area of the base times the height. So, since it's like a rectangular section, we can do length times width times the height. And remember, height, depth, thickness, all the same thing. So I see that the length would be 11. I think that's 11. I kind of colored on it. Let me just get yeah, 11. Um, width, we could do 12. Well, or length 12 uh, with 11, whichever way. doesn't matter. Multiplication is competitive. And then the height or the thickness in this case is 1.25. So if I put this into my calculator, I have 11 times 12 times 1.25, and I get 165 cubic inches. Okay, now let's do the top part, and then we'll do the hand grips, which we have to take away from the whole volume. So, we can think once again in terms of area of the base and the height. So you might be able to see that this is kind of circular. It looks like half of a circle, to be honest, if it was a 2D shape. So we know that we find area of a circle by doing pi r squared. And since this is a 3D shape, it's area of the base times the height. So we have pi r squared, which is the area of you know, the circle times the height. This looks like a cylinder formula. So that tells us that the shape of the top part of the kickboard is actually half of the cylinder. Um, remember, it's half, not the whole thing. It's not a whole circle, not the whole cylinder. It's half. So we are going to have to divide by two. Okay, so let's plug in. So we have volume is equal to pi. The radius is given to us as 5.5. So let me plug that in, 5.5 squared. And then the height is like the height, the depth, or the thickness of like the whole kickboard, which we know is 1.25. Um, that thickness applies throughout the kickboard. The kickboard is all the same thickness or height as you go throughout it. So that's 1.25. Okay. So multiplying this all together in my calculator, I have pi 
times 5.5 squared times 1.25. And I almost forgot, we do need to divide by two because we spoke about how this is a half cylinder. It's like half of a circular region. It's not a full, you know, cylinder or full circular region. So we have to divide this by two. I almost forgot to do that. And I got approximately 59 point, I'll keep a couple of decimal places, 3957 cubic inches. Okay, so now let's put these together. So we can get the volume of the whole kickboard with, and uh, then we'll take away the hand grips. This is with the hand grips, and then we'll take away the hand grips after. So I have 165 plus the 59. 0.3957 number. And I got 224.3957 inches cubed. So that's for the entire kickboard with the hand grips. But remember, we have to take away the hand grips. So let's find the volume of the two hand grips so that we can subtract it from the volume of the whole kickboard. So I'll write here that this is the volume of the whole kickboard. We want to subtract away the hand grip. So we have to find what that is so that we're able to subtract it. So let's do that work over here. We have volume of the hand grips. So I see that the hand grip here is like blown up so we can see it better. And there's like a rectangular part over here. And then there's like the half circular parts over here as well, just like we had when we were finding the volume of the kickboard of the top part. So for the rectangular part, we can find that by doing length times width times height. So let me just make this a bit clear over here by erasing some of the stuff so we can see it better. So I'm going to just highlight that rectangular part again. I don't think this made it any easier to see. So let me erase that. It's just a little bit small. Okay, so we see that we have two for one of the dimensions. And then each one of these is 0.6. So the whole way across here would be 1.2. And then the thickness of the kickboard is 1.25. So that was basically length times width times height. The length and width of the rectangular part of the hand grip times the height or the thickness of the entire kickboard. Okay. Now the hand grips are also made up of these half circular parts over here. So... Remember when we did the top over here that was like the same shape? We said area of the circular part is pi r squared times the height of the entire kickboard. But we divided it by two because it was like half of a circular part. Here, we once again have half of a circular part, but we have two halves, which makes a whole. So I don't need to divide by two. I have two halves, which makes a whole. Let me plug in. So the radius is given as 0.6. And the height of anything on this kickboard is going to be the thickness or the height of the kickboard, which is 1.25. Okay, let me... Oh, and I'm almost forgetting. There's not just one hand grip. There's two hand grips. So after we add this together and we find the volume of one of the hand grips, we're going to have to multiply it by two to get the volume of both hand grips, since there's two hand grips. So let me type into my calculator, 2 times 1.2 times 1.25 plus pi times 0.6 squared times 1.25, and I got about 4.4137. I do need to multiply by two because there are two hand grips, not just one. So that's about 
8274. So I do want to keep a couple of decimal places. So now that we have the volume of the hand grips, we can shift it from the volume of the whole kickboard since the hand grips are not really part of the kickboard. And I get. Approximately two hundred and fifteen point fifty seven cubic inches. Now it doesn't tell us how the round it should, so I'm just going to round to two decimal places. That's part A. That is our final volume, and this is much more complicated than anything you'll see on your test. So if you understand this one, then you should have no problem with anything that you'll see on your test. Okay. And for part B, I'll just indicate that we're doing part B now. It says one cubic inch of foam, cubic inch of foam, weighs about 0 0.007 pounds. So I see a mass unit and a volume unit. So that tells me that this number over here is the density. How much does the kickboard weigh? So density equals to mass over volume. I'll write that down. Density equals to mass over volume. So we know the density is 0 0.007 pounds per cubic inch because it says one cubic inch weighs about 0 0.007 pounds so that's pounds per cubic inch is equal to we are finding the weight of the kickboard so we're finding the mass over volume which we just found before we just found the volume of the whole kickboard we found it to be 215.57 cubic inches now inches cubed is in the numerator and the denominator so they cancel out our mass unit that we're left over with is pounds, with is pounds, and that makes sense because we're finding the weight of the kickboard. Now, all we need to do is cross multiply. So we have x is equal to, let me multiply the 215.57 by 0 0.007, and I got approximately 1.5 pounds as my answer.